Good morning, Salukis. I'm Cynthia Graham, Vice President of External Relations here at Southwest Tennessee Community College. Today with me, we have Vice President of Student Affairs, Jacqueline Faulkner, and Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Kendrick Hooker. We hope to answer your questions today about coming back on campus uh, yeah. in July this month and yeah. about okay. coming back on campus in the fall. In order to answer a question, if you'll go to the Q&A, if you'll list it there, we'll start answering your questions. But before we begin, uh, VP Faulkner, would you like to say a few words? Absolutely. Thank you, VP Graham. Good morning, Saluki family. Again, my name is Jacqueline Faulkner. Um, for the past four plus years, I've had the tremendous opportunity of serving as the Vice President for Student Affairs here at Southwest Tennessee Community College. In the Division of Student Affairs, we work to support you academically throughout your life cycle with, with us here at Southwest. We complement what happens in the classroom, ensuring that you have all of the tools, services, and resources available to you to meet your academic goals. Um, we recognize that there are probably a three different audiences of students that are here with us today. You might be a new student who has just been admitted to Southwest, planning to start in the fall, and you have questions about um, how to get documents completed, how to do new student orientation, how to re register for courses. We recognize that some of you might be returning students who have either already registered or, or are waiting to learn more information prior to registration. And we hope to be able to provide that information to you today about how we will enter campus, how your courses will be scheduled, how you will learn and how you will be supported throughout this process. And then I'm pretty sure we probably have some prospective students and if I know correctly, parents as well, who might be on the fence about whether or not to send your loved one, and I will say our student, to Southwest or to another institution. And you just want to learn more about how we will be operating moving forward and you want to get more information. Again, we will provide as much knowledge and resources that we can on this forum today to help allay any fears, answer any questions that you might have to make the most qualified decisions moving forward. Um, just for clarity purposes, I mentioned earlier that my division supports students throughout the life cycle from connection all the way to completion, but I wanted to clarify the departments that fall under my purview in case there are specific questions about any of the areas. I support recruitment, admissions, records, dual enrollment, financial aid, career services, testing, retention, and student success, enrollment services, academic advising, student development, child care centers, upward bound, counseling and social services, Title III, academic support center, and the final one is what we're all aspiring to, and that's graduation. So if you have any questions about any of my areas, we will um, start to answer questions shortly after my colleague, who I'm happy has joined me today, uh, has introduced himself. Dr. Hooker. Thank you, VP Faulkner. As mentioned, uh, my name is Kendrick Hooker, and I have the great fortune of being able to serve as the Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Southwest Tennessee Community College. So thanks to you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us in this forum. Um, given all that's currently going on in our communities and across this nation, uh, we deemed it necessary to avail ourselves to provide some clarity, guidance, and address any questions or concerns that you might have. Uh, but briefly, I plan to touch on my role here at Southwest, share some highlights of phase one, and then, as mentioned, open the forum up to any questions that you may have. Um, as mentioned, I serve as the Vice President of Academic Affairs. In this role, I work with faculty across a variety of credit and non-credit programs who are deeply committed to student success and the college. I am also accountable for the overall success of the academic affairs operations, which includes instruction, assessment, and faculty development programs. I work with the deans and chairs from the respective um, divisions in creating and building academic programs, community-focused academic services, interdisciplinary initiatives with a focus on supporting your success. 
Um, in this role, I also work with workforce development and Project Most. So many of the students, may, many of you may be a part of Project Most. So I work with Project Most as well. Um, as far as what's going to happen beginning tomorrow, tomorrow we plan to have a very, very soft opening. In this soft opening, all students and faculty are required to wear PPE to gain entrance into the buildings and must wear the PPE for the entire duration of their experience on campus. Um, this time will allow us to bring um, courses or students that receive eyes in the spring. This will allow us to bring some of those courses to completion. This is also a, a time for many of our summer courses to commence. So many of our summer courses are online, so they will begin and then also some additional courses in which there has to be face to face instruction will occur as well. Um, academic Affairs has worked tirelessly and weekly with physical plant and police services to make sure that we've covered all bases as it pertains to students coming back to campus and faculty coming back to campus. We have considered all realistic scenarios that we could possibly think of. Uh, considering that none of us has experienced this pandemic before, um, we are doing our homework. We will constantly stay abreast of changes that are taking place in our community and across the state and across this nation to make sure that your health and safety is at the forefront of all the decisions that we make. So with that said, VP Graham, um, we can open it up to any questions that the students may have. Great, thank you both. Again, I'll remind the students that to answer to ask a question, all you have to do is to type it in the um, little box that you see in the middle with the question mark, uh, with the bubble, it looks like it's over your head. So if you'll type it in there, I'll read it and we'll do our best to get an answer. Our first question, uh, Dr. Hooker, I believe is for you. Which classes will meet starting tomorrow? Which classes will be meeting starting tomorrow? OK, so by now online courses will take place so if you're taking an online course obviously there's no need to access campus um, but there are some courses some of our cte courses career and technical education courses in which there will be some face-to-face -face instruction at this time those students should have been in contact have should have been contacted by their instructor so they should know specifically um, what building what room location and any specifics that they need to know um, for this experience um, if you have not been in communication with your um, with your instructor, please check your email because I am very confident that they've attempted to reach out to all students as we prepare for this very soft opening tomorrow. Great, thank you. We don't we don't have another question right now, so let's talk about before a student comes on campus, uh, VP Faulkner, what should they do? Well. By now, again, um, all students who will be assessing campus tomorrow should have received an email or text message and or text message um, that includes a health care assessment, a health assessment. And it, there it should be titled No Before You Go. So please assess that assessment. Complete it prior to coming to campus. It will ask a number of questions surrounding um, your health, your um, travel um, over the past two weeks, um, any exposure to COVID-19. There are a number of questions that will assess your readiness to come to campus and safety in coming to campus. It will also include directional information about where to um, actually filter onto the campus once you arrive to both Union and Macon Cove campuses because those are the only two at this point in the soft opening that will be open. You should also have a video that I encourage all students to review. That video actually um, um, talks you through the entire process of the assessment, how to check in, have your temperature scanned, ensure that you have the PPE and reporting to your respective course. So again, go to the know before you go email. If you cannot find that email or if you like me and it might have been buried in some other email by now, go to our website. It's very prominently placed on our website and it again states know before you go and it will have that assessment and all of the information that you need to again uh, come to campus on tomorrow. VP Graham, is it possible that we can show that video now rather than Absolutely. towards the end? Right. Absolutely. Uh, Daphne, would you run the video? This is the know before you go video. It is accessible on our website and again, you should have received a link. 
Your health and safety are a top priority at Southwest Tennessee Community College. This video will provide an overview of how to gain access to the Macon Cove campus as we respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. You will learn how to access campus by car, bus, or on foot. But before you come to campus, it is important to know before you go. Be sure to take the online health assessment before you leave home. Access the quick, easy questionnaire in the Southwest website. If you fail the assessment, please do not come to campus. Monitor your health and contact your health care provider if you feel unwell. If you successfully complete the assessment, you may either print your health assessment pass or have it sent to you via email or cell phone text. Be sure to bring your health assessment pass with you to campus. If you're driving yourself to campus, here's how you will access the Macon Cove campus. When you enter campus, immediately proceed to the scanning station. Show the attendant your health pass that confirms you completed the online health assessment and received a pass. You must have a health pass to gain entrance. Show your health pass to the attendant. You can easily store this pass on your cell phone through text or email or print it out at home. Next, you will receive a body temperature screening. Everyone in your vehicle must be screened. This is a touchless process that takes just a few seconds. You and all parties in your car must register a temperature no higher than 100.6 degrees. If anyone has a temperature higher than this, that person will be asked to wait five minutes for a rescan. Only individuals who pass the scan will be allowed on campus. Those who fail the scan must exit the campus. If you do not have your own face mask and gloves, Southwest will provide them. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, must be worn at all times while on campus. You are now admitted to the Macon Cove campus. Park your car in the designated area and proceed to campus. For those individuals who arrive to campus by public transportation, such as a bus, deboard at the bus stop screening station. Here is where you will complete the campus access process. Show the attendant your health assessment pass. You can easily store this pass on your cell phone through text or email or print it out at home. Once inside the tent, your body temperature will be screened. If your body temperature falls within range, you will move on to the next step. You must register a temperature no higher than 100.6 degrees. If your temperature is higher than this, you will be asked to wait five minutes for a rescan. If you fail the rescan, you cannot be admitted to campus and must leave campus. Pick up a face mask and gloves if you do not bring your own. If you do not have a face mask and gloves, Southwest will provide this personal protective equipment for your use at all times while you're on campus. You are now admitted to the Micken Cove campus. After you pass your online health assessment and arrive to campus on foot, follow these easy steps for campus access. Proceed to the bus stop scanning station. Show your online health assessment pass to the attendant. You must complete the online health assessment and receive a passing score each day that you plan to access campus. The pass is easily stored to your cell phone through text or email, or you can print it out at home. Get your body temperature scan. This is a quick, touchless process. Your temperature must be below 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit to access campus. You must register a temperature no higher than 100.6 degrees. If your temperature is higher than this, you will be asked to wait five minutes for a rescan. If you fail the rescan, you cannot be admitted to campus. Pick up a face mask and gloves if you do not bring your own. If you do not have a face mask and gloves, Southwest will provide this personal protective equipment for your use at all times while you're on campus. You are now admitted to the Macon Cove campus. Once you are granted access to campus, look for signage to locate open buildings. Not all buildings will be accessible. Check the college's back to campus plan on the Southwest website before arriving to campus to see whether your classes will be held and which buildings will be open. Here are a few tips to ensure you have a smooth experience accessing campus so that you can focus on your goals at Southwest. Know before you go. Be sure to check out the website at southwest.tn.edu each day for updates. Also, stay tuned to your Southwest email for important messages. Fill out your health assessment each day before you come to campus. You must pass this test. If you fail or feel sick in any way, please stay home and take care of yourself. Contact your instructor to alert them of your absence. We want you to stay healthy, but we understand if you do not feel well 
and we are here to help you get through this challenging time. You must wear a face covering and gloves at all times while on campus. Remember to practice social distancing, which means to maintain a distance of six feet between you and others at all times. Once your class is over, do not linger on campus. Leave immediately for your safety and for the safety of your fellow Salukis. Have a great semester. Thank you and be well. Thank you, Daphne, for showing that video. Again, I wanna say that that video is located on our website and you should have received an email with a link to the video. That one was for the Union campus. There is also a video for the Macon campus. Uh, let's that start was, our- that was for the Macon campus, but we do oh, have sorry. one for the Union campus as well. Thank you, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a few questions, so we'll start. Uh, uh, VP Faulkner, I'm guessing this is a, a prospective student. They're sure. saying, how can I choose which campus I want to attend? Okay. Uh, primarily, as Dr. Hooker stated earlier, primarily the vast majority of our classes will be held online if they can be taught online in the fall. Again, uh, in an effort to remain cautious and aware of the, the ongoing uh, pandemic. Um, so I will encourage you to look at the schedule, which is available through our website, and it actually uh, allows you to filter by campus, by modality, to if you're in a, a particular program that requires you to come to campus, again, the courses will be designated by which campus they will be facilitated. So you can filter by Macon Cove or Union um, campus to identify classes that are just offered on that particular site um, or location. And also working with your academic advisor, with your professional academic advisor. If you have specific questions um, about your course, um, about the modality or the location, you can work with your academic advisor to have those questions answered. But the schedule is very prescriptive in nature. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is about the Maxine Smith campus. Uh, Dr. Hooker, will there be classes on the Maxine Smith campus in the fall? Um, thank you for that question. And at this time, um, limited access is, is being considered for the Maxine Smith Center. Um, we're still working out the details. Um, we have some uh, program offers that, that essentially needs to take place there, um, but we'll follow up soon. Uh, but in short, the goal is to have some offerings there. Great, thank you. We have a question from Charles, and he's asking a few things. And I, I think uh, maybe we've answered the beginning of his question, which will all campuses, will all classes be on campus in the fall? And then the second, second part of that question is how do I inquire about a laptop and how do I qualify for this new program? Thanks, Charles. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I will reiterate um, the first question um, that no, all classes will not be on campus. Um, it's quite the reverse. The majority of our campuses will, uh, uh, classes will be online or in some form of hybrid model. Um, so that answers the first question. Relative to laptops, we're very excited um, about our opportunity to uh, narrow and close that digital divide. We know that for many of our students, when we abruptly transition to um, the online format in March as, as COVID-19 really hit um, its heightened uh, uh, portion of, of, of this uh, period, um, many of our students were um, thrust and our faculty and staff were thrust into an online environment and um, many lacked the tools in order to be successful. Uh, we're very fortunate to have very caring faculty and staff that were agile, flexible to help students be successful even despite um, not having the tools. At this point, we as an institution have committed to helping meet those needs for our students. So we're in the process right now of purchasing over 3,000 computers that will be um, accessible to students uh, in order to uh, facilitate learning, teaching and learning in the next semester. Uh, we are ironing out all of the details about checkout process. We're working with our IT department, so look forward to communications forthcoming about how to check out, how to retrieve, 
what are the requirements in order to, um, uh, of course, you know, there will be some policies and procedures and, and documentation that has to be signed to ensure that um, individuals are students and are caring for the equipment, but all of that will be forthcoming in the coming weeks. Um, so look forward to further communications via email, text messages, robocalls uh, when we are ready to uh, roll out checkout. Um, but it will be in a timely fashion prior to our start of fall in August on August 24th. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, our next question is when will testing centers be open? OK, so I will answer that we at the testing center will continue um, in a remote environment. At this point, we have a few things that are important to note. Uh, one is that uh, we recently received guidance from Tennessee Board of Regents, who is our governing body that will allow us to place students in their courses. Uh, using what we call multiple measures, which means that students would not have to have a certain score or uh, numeric value on the ACT, SAT, or ACCUPLACE in order to be placed, but that we can place students based upon their high school GPA. And there are some thresholds that have been set at a 2.8 or above and students will be uh, able to um, actually enroll in college level courses. So that again eliminates or minimizes some of the need for on campus testing for students who might be preparing to graduate. We have two things that are, have been put in place. We've also received guidance from the state that our ETS end of term um, uh, graduation requirements will be waived for summer graduates. So if you are needing testing for end of uh, term graduation exit exams, um, those will be waived. Uh, and for students who are required to take their major field exams, those are offered through the Paul system. It's actually offered online, so you will still be able to meet that need. We do have limited testing available for some of our adult students um, or students who might have um, an alternate to a high school diploma. So a student who might not have graduated from high school but completed the high set. Um, that or the GED testing, we have limited online testing that's available for you to actually take the acuplacer and still be placed. So we have worked out every avenue that tests that are traditionally offered in a brick and mortar format um, through our testing center are now being met through a virtual environment. And if you have any follow up questions or specific questions about tests, you can certainly reach out to our director of testing services, who is Ms. Shatika Ferris. Great, thank you. Our next question is about the calendar. Uh, Dr. Hooker, is our calendar changing? I know U of M is starting earlier to have people on campus and exams are the week after Thanksgiving. Uh, Dr. Hooker? Yes, so we, we've done a, a couple of things. Um, one, and let's specifically look at the fall since it is fast, fast, fast approaching. Um, we have a 15 week schedule and our 15 week schedule um, lasts um, um, the entire duration of the fall and it goes from August 24th until December 12th, I believe. And then and that the 15 week schedule is online only. And then we also have a 13 week term and the 13 week term begins August um, 24th and I think it ends on. I believe it's November 22nd, but it is going to actually end before Thanksgiving. Um, and one of the reasons that we felt that that was important because these 13 week, um, the 13 week term will potentially have some face to face instruction. So if you are in a CTE course, a career and technical education course that requires some face to face instruction, it allows us to try to get most or, or all of that done before Thanksgiving, before our students, faculty and staff begin to travel. Um, so our schedule is very similar to the way that it was last fall. It's just that now we have a 15 week term in which it is online only. We have a 13 week term term that will conclude before Thanksgiving. And then we also have winter sessions that are four weeks. And then when we move into the spring, we have some additional opportunities um, for students as well. Both the fall and the spring will have flex terms. So our flex terms, we have a flex one and a flex two each term. And those terms will be um, uh, will be six in six week increments. Um, so I don't know if that 
totally aligns with uh, U of M, um, but I believe it certainly allows uh, unique opportunities for our students. Great, thank you. And this calendar can be found on our website. That so is correct. You, you don't have to take a screenshot right now trying to uh, make sure you can see this. It is on the Southwest website. Be sure to look there. Um, I believe this, Dr. Faulkner, is, I mean, VP Faulkner is probably for you. Sure. We have a student who's received a notification on their dashboard to provide proof of selective res registration. Uh, he is in his second year at Southwest and is a Tennessee ReConnect student. Sure. Uh, what should he do? If I'm interpreting the question correctly, it's probably based upon selective service. Yes. Um, Department of Education requires um, that we have any male students uh, proof of registration for selective services. That is a standard requirement. Even if a student is receiving state funds through Tennessee Promise, through Tennessee Reconnect, often those uh, state requirements require that all financial aid uh, requirements have been met before they can be dispersed because it is a last dollar scholarship. So in order to ensure that um, the student is not eligible for any financial aid, um, federal financial aid, all of those requirements must be met before the state funds can be awarded. So if there are specific questions. I'm assuming that I, that's the selective service question, but if it's not, feel free to reach out to our uh, financial aid office. Every student has been assigned a financial aid special reach out specifically to your financial aid specialist or to uh, the financial aid office during office hours. We have virtual office hours daily um, from Monday through Friday from 8 to 530. Um, so feel free to visit the financial aid office virtually and you can assess that through um, the financial aid department website and, and it will actually show you how to assess through Microsoft Teams. But if you have specific questions that that did not answer, feel free to reach out. Thank you, VP Faulkner. Yes. Our next question comes from Elaine Swain, and um, I, I will just throw this out. I, it seems to me it has a little bit of a question for both uh, VP Faulkner and VP Hooker. So the pandemic has created extra use in fees for hotspots. What are you going to do uh, as far as being able to use ASC, the break rooms, individual study rooms, places on campus, I believe is what she's asking about. So yes, there that um, is definitely one that falls in both of our camps. And I will say we are working on our uh, finalizing our phase reopening plans. Um, in this soft reopening, as well as in the fall, there are no plans to reopen our labs and library spaces. Again, um, ex we're extremely concerned about the cost associated with um, hotspots, um, but we also have to make the decisions that are that err along caution for our institution. And, and of course, um, in those open spaces, it's very difficult to socially distance. So we um, don't have plans in the first phase to reopen. I will say that our CIO, uh, Mr. Michael Boyd, has been working strategically with many of the providers um, and and uh, we're fortunate that many of the providers such as Xfinity, AT&T, Verizon, some of those larger providers are aware of those um, zones that lack uh, the connectivity that needs to happen. Um, and they are addressing that from a strategic level um, for communities that have been disenfranchised. So, and he's very vocal in those conversations and we will continue to try to advocate to ensure that, um, not necessarily for the hotspots because we know that those are very costly uh, when purchased on a monthly basis, but certainly for some of those providers to provide wider network. And there are a number of programs that are available on our student resources page of the COVID-19 uh, website that have um, very um, low cost, if you will, internet services. I think there's a, a, a Com Comcast Essentials, that's a $10 per month uh, package. So there are some nominal cost providers that are out there and we are ensuring that we're updating that list regularly for students. Great, thank you. Our next question is about social distance, distancing and mask. If I start, uh, well, I guess there's two questions here. Will there be social distancing? Will masks be provided is the first part of his question. And then if I start class and change my mind and want to go completely online, is that possible? 
Well, the answer to your first two questions regarding social distancing and masks, the answer is yes and yes. Um, <laughs> if you change your mind, so you've, I'm assuming you're asking if you are currently in a, um, a course this summer that requires face-to-face -face instruction, will you be able to change your mind? Well, the courses that we have that are that are being offered this summer that require face-to-face -face instruction are very, very specific. Um, and the content that is being, um, the content in those courses are needed for students to fulfill their obligations for that course. Um, and in, in most cases, it doesn't allow um, online opportunities. And the courses that we're specifically talking about are courses primarily in health. So if it is not a health course or um, a, a course in business, particularly automotives or welding or something like that, then that, that's not a concern. If you are in one of those courses, then your faculty, your instructor should have been in contact with you and you all should have a plan in place um, for you to fulfill those, um, um, the, the hands-on lab experiences or lab activities. Um, the majority of our courses, as VP Faulkner has already had, has indicated, the majority of our courses are gonna be online. And then some of the courses that do have a hybrid component, um, a portion of it is gonna be online. And then the other portion is still going to be technically online as students will meet in Microsoft Teams and or Zoom. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, and if not, please follow up. Great, thank you. Um, our next question I, I think is also probably for you, Dr. Hooker. I want to know, have instructors had proper and current training to help students with this new transition? Are they prepared to be caring, patient and helpful? Well, I think um, VP Falcon alluded to this, and, and I, I would like to echo what she indicated, is that our faculty, for the most part, have been, you know, we, we've all, we were all thrust into this virtual online world um, at the same time. And we talked about the digital divide. I mean, th that was not only for students, but there were some concerns for faculty as well. Um, so what we've done as an institution is that we've met, we've had many discussions to try to um, close this digital divide. And one of the things that faculty have been asked to do, essentially, well, essentially was a mandate, is to um, complete their online certification training. Um, so all faculty beginning this fall, well, actually this summer, um, have been asked and will complete online training. And we believe that this is going to equip the faculty with the tools and resources needed um, to meet your needs in this virtual online world. Um, we will continue to ask fa faculty to be flexible, to be agile as they meet your needs, because again, life happens. And if, if no other time in the past, this is a time for all of us um, to be empathetic and to understand that there are unique challenges that we all may face. Um, so I certainly believe our faculty is going to meet your needs in that regard. Our faculty have also been asked to make sure that they post their office hours and to be available for those office hours. Um, so I believe faculty is going to do an amazing job in, in, in meeting those needs. I think if there were some challenges in the spring, I believe it had more to do with the fact that we were all thrust into a world that we had to try to quickly navigate. And before you know it, the semester was over. Um, but I think we've had thoughtful and considerate conversations since, and we should be more than prepared. And, and if I can add something there, VP Graham, um, as I started this um, conversation, uh, stating that what we do in the Division of Student Affairs complements the academic experience and what happens in the classroom. I want to ensure that our students are aware of all of the resources and supports that we have in place to help students. One thing that I'm excited about this summer, and it started with summer one and will continue with summer two, is that our academic support center has supplemental instruction leaders that are embedded in the vast majority of our summer classes. Not all, but the vast majority of our summer classes. So they are here in the same lesson that you are. And and if you encounter a concern in um, in your understanding of that lesson, they offer some SI sessions, if you will, where they will actually provide more understanding and information um, of, about the content of the lesson. So we work again in collaboration with Academic Affairs. We also have tutoring available in a virtual environment through the Academic Support Center where you can actually have real-time peer or professional tutors that will meet with you 
and discuss whatever subject you might be having concerns in. And for students who might be night owls, we have Smart Thinking, which is online tutoring that's available 24 seven. Great, thank you, um, both VB Hooker and VP Faulkner. Uh, I, I would say if you just don't know where to go and you're struggling, call Student Services and they will get you to the right place. I, I think most of you know that, but in case you don't, they're Absolutely. waiting for your call. Thank you for that vote of confidence, and we <laughs> certainly will. <laughs> Welcome. All right, Dr. Hooker, here we have a question about those incompletes. How are you going to evaluate the I when the new system is a major cause, not able to log in, log on, but not the teacher's fault? And that's coming from Elaine Swain. Okay, I want to make sure I understand the question and properly answered. Could you? Repeat sure. that. How are you going to evaluate the I? Since when the new system is a major cause, I'm assuming that she means when being online has become the major cause of getting an I, the, perhaps the student wasn't able to log in or log on, but it's not the teacher's fault. They just had some technical issues. Okay, well, Considering that we're hopeful that our faculty will be empathetic, agile, and flexible, I think this um, this certainly requires a conversation with that faculty member. Um, there may be an opportunity for us to check to see if there were some login issues from our end. I'm not sure, but maybe there's, there's an opportunity to check to see if there was something that um, wasn't in place on our end. Um, but I think just having a conversation with, with, with your instructor um, and he or she will work with you um, to bring that I to a completion. Um, if you have not, and I'm assuming this was from the spring, if you have not communicated with them uh, since the spring, please um, come in contact with them as soon as you possibly can, and they will work with you to bring this to a completion. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hooker. I would add that if, if now in the summer term or in the fall, if you're having trouble logging in, please call uh, tech support. Uh, reach out, try to get some help because sometimes it may not be uh, something on your end, it may be on our end, or there may be a simple solution. Yeah, and I will also state, I'm, I'm again uh, referring individuals to our website. We have um, a, a, a pamphlet, a document that's called Achieving Your Dreams Online, and it will avail you of so many of the technology solutions that can help you, um, again, in your matriculation in this online environment. So if you're having concerns of how to uh, log into the Paul system, how to log into your LMS, or uh, we have new technology solutions called EAB Navigate and Degree Works. Um, it really will prescribe all of the technology tools that we have available, how you assess them as a student because they are available to you and they are put in place for your success. Um, and it will also avail you to how to connect with our help desk if you need to do so. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Daphne, Ms. Thomas. Uh, there is this document, Achieve, Achieving Your Dreams Online. We recognize when we transition that this would be the first time for online learning for many of our students. And so uh, we developed this document that pretty much talks to you about some tips to be successful, the tools that were there, how to navigate. Um, it will really, really be beneficial if you are just starting your online journey. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, I believe Dr. Hooker will be yours. Can we prevent a class from being canceled despite having low registrants? I have had classes canceled, which impacted my path to graduation. Case in point, I'm enrolled in cultural anthropology and need this class to transfer to the U of M. However, only five students have enrolled. Again, this class is needed for my pathway. Dr. Hooker. Hmm. That's 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 a very good question, and thank you for presenting that question to me. Um, let me follow up. I, th I think the best way to address this is to follow up. Um, um, follow up after this after, after this uh, forum. If you would, please just send me an email. Um, I can be emailed at KD Hooker at Southwest, and you know the rest. KD Hooker. Great, and I will take this time to say to students because I know we have a lot of questions. I'm hopeful that we'll get through all of them, 
but if we do not answer your question uh, during this forum, we will post those online on our website or you are welcome. Well, we will do that. In addition, you are welcome to reach out to any of the three of us. Uh, I think you you heard what falls under uh, VP Faulkner's area and academic affairs falls under Dr. Hooker's. If you have a question that you're not sure where it goes, send it to me and I'll get it to the right person and we'll get back to you. As we're seeing questions on the side, unless you put your name on them, we don't know who you are. So don't assume that we are going to personally reach out to you. But the answer is, if again, we'll be online if we don't get to all the questions. Uh, the next question, again, Dr. Hooker, I believe is yours. It says, my microbiology class is the only class that shows it's being held on campus. But when I asked my professor, she said it would be fully online. I'm confused why it still shows different when I look up the class on the website. OK, and we will follow up with that as well, because I it, I, I think um, your instructor is correct. Um, the natural sciences courses should be online. Um, and especially if you're referring to the summer, it should be online. So I'm not sure why it is showing different um, in our system. So I'll follow up, um, but it's certainly online this summer if you're referring to the summer. Right. And, and I will say in the coming weeks, we will be working with marketing communications to um, actually give some navigational information for your detailed schedule. So you will know how to read and interpret where your course is, whether it's online or, um, or in a, a lecture based on campus model, what campus, if that is uh, relevant, as well as what's the modality. So you will you will receive navigational information that will identify, will probably have some screenshots of a student schedule and tell you how to read um, certain information so that you are clear um, in August whether you will be on campus, online, and how to assess either. Great, and our next two questions are exactly about that. Mm -hmm. um, it's being registered in the fall. What classes will be online? What classes will be um, on, on, in the building? Um, how will they find this out? And I think you you pretty much answered those questions. But but to clarify, will most of the lecture classes be online or in person on campus? Well, it is safe to say that um, the majority of our courses will be online. Um, so the goal is to shift as many courses as possible online um, and then we will have hybrid opportunities as well. And hybrid um, is, is an instructional modality in which there is some online, but there's also some face to face and or Microsoft Teams opportunity in which you will meet with the instructor um, via Microsoft Teams. Hopefully all of the students have had the opportunity to uh, um, to to learn um, via Microsoft Teams and or Zoom. Um, if not, um, that is we, we will certainly um, present that to you this fall or this summer. Great, and uh, thank you for saying that, Dr. Hooker, because I'm, I'm going to speak to another audience on this call. Again, we have new students, we have prospective students. Microsoft Teams is uh, free to uh, you as a student on our campus. Once you receive your login information or have been admitted to the campus, you should be able to download Microsoft Teams. And I encourage you to start playing around in Teams, whether it's through the school or through your own um, account that you set up in an email address. Start playing around in Teams, um, understanding what the various icons mean, because that will be our primary um, resource for again the online instruction or for the remote instruction if you will. So just familiarize yourself with it, familiarize yourself with pause and with the LMS system so that you are aware of where you can find your grades, where you can find assignments, where you can upload your feedback. So the more you become comfortable in the tool, it's just a matter of executing what you already know to do in the fall, and that's the learning and uh, and again uh, doing your assignments. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question, and, and I'm having to assume a little bit about what her question is. She's asking about book scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, so VP Faulkner, that kind of falls under the both of us. Um, she said normally uh, book scholarships you receive the first week. She's saying it's not that way now. I, I'm not sure what her question is, but would you speak to how uh, what the first step is for book scholarships? 
Well, we have book scholarships through a um, myriad of resources, and I'm, I'm not sure. I'm concerned when I hear that it's not the first week if we're talking about book scholarships or book uh, awards as a result of your financial aid, because we have three different pockets. Some of our students have what we call an over award. Um, and that means you are eligible for a refund check after your financial aid has been applied. For those students, we send out a $500 book award that comes from your financial aid. So it's not a scholarship. It's actually just you receiving parts of your refund check early in order to be able to purchase books. Many of our courses right now um, have electronic books that are already assessed to you. And so for many of our courses, you there's no requirement that you purchase um, books separately or go through the bookstore because they're already assessed as a part of your tuition and fees, and they are ready on day one of, of you beginning your course. We also have book scholarships that are administered through our foundation office that um, VP Graham alluded to. And uh, I, I think much like our other book scholarships, they're taking applications as we speak. And we also have book scholarships that are available for students, our adult students who are a part of the SMARTS mentoring program. And that information has been made available and can be applied for day one. So um, not sure of which book awards we're uh, specifically stating are not available that week before. But if you have follow up questions or if this did not answer your question, feel free to contact my office directly and we'll try to get you the appropriate response. Thank you, VP Faulkner. Um, OK, Dr. Hooker, here we go. Will the labs meet at the Macon campus? I am a, I am in biology and trying to determine when we will meet on campus and when online. Thank you and great question. So for the natural science courses this summer, if you're referring to this summer, um, all of those courses uh, will be virtual. Um, so they will be online. Your labs will be virtual. Um, so in terms of access to campus, that will not take place this summer. For the fall, we're still having some discussions and further communication regarding how the fall will look will be forthcoming. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is about where do they find out if their classes will be online or on campus? Mm -hmm. And again, that's a part of your detailed schedule. Um, if once you have registered, you will actually look on your detailed schedule, you will see a, a um, instructional type. Um, and it might say online, it might say lecture, it might say hybrid. You will also see information about e-learn. If you see information about e-learn, then those are courses that either online or ha have an online component and are hybrid. So they are, it is specifically stated on your schedule. If you do not understand reading that schedule, um, please reach out to your professional academic advisor who can assist you with clarifying where that information, where you should be in the fall. And again, as I stated earlier, we will be working with marketing and communications to ensure that there are some navigational types of um, uh, documents that are put out to help students easily identify where they should be. Great, thank you. We have another question from Elaine. She's asking about those computers, uh, VP Faulkner. Uh, she does not know that we are going to have some computers that students can access. So um, can you tell us about that one more time? A absolutely. We're, we're quite excited that um, we, we acknowledged when we moved to uh, a fully online environment in March that many of our students um, were, were not able to um, um, actually have the tools that they needed in order to successfully do so. We um, worked with our faculty partners to ensure that students were brought to completion even despite not having those tools. But as a campus, we are committed to now getting those devices and those tools to meet the needs of our students. So we have over 3,000 uh, computers, laptops that are currently being purchased. As a matter of fact, 3,500, let me be specific, that are currently being purchased in this first phase. Um, there is a goal uh, moving forward to be able to provide this to all of our students. But right now we're meeting the specific needs. We assessed our students um, 
uh, again, immediately upon moving to on an online environment to see who had computers and who did not. About 30% of our students, um, which is very consistent with the national um, data, about 30 to 35% of our students identified that they did not have computers in order to be successful. And so we have committed to this very first phase of purchasing 3,500 computers that will be available prior to the fall. We're working out all of the details about how checkout will happen, um, the requirements um, and documentation needed, but you will receive all of that information in the coming weeks and uh, learn of how to come and actually retrieve that tool. Great. So Ms. Elaine, we are meeting that need for our students. Great, thank you. Uh, we had a couple of questions about purchasing books in the fall. Will the bookstore be open or will they have to go back to like we did at the end of the semester to an online uh, order from Fallex? We have not received the complete information, but Follett typically follows the, the lead of the campus. And so we will continue to utilize their online, their virtual bookstore, uh, which is available on our website and will be emailed out to all students uh, to purchase those books um, and, and have them delivered. And actually, I think even in returning, they send a um, self-addressed stamped envelope even for the return of those books. So it's it's a very seamless process that has been put in place with our, our bookstore partners and uh, you will receive that information, but we are um, very clear that it probably will continue in a virtual format. Right. And I'm sure Follettes will do everything they can to make that as simple as yes. possible. Absolutely. They want to continue to have your business. Mm -hmm. uh, our next question, if you have already registered for the fall semester, and all of the cl classes are lectured based. Will those classes, uh, will those classes be only online, Dr. Hooker? And the answer to that is yes. Um, so, yeah, yeah. The yes, okay. I mean, simple answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next person uh, tells us the online format is confusing. Is there a way to know if the courses? will have lectures provided by the professor or if it will just be a video video links embedded throughout the course. The description hybrid is very ambiguous. Some professors have great reviews about their lecturing and personalities on Rate My Professor. However, it's hard to know if I sign up for that class whether or not I'll get those lectures and the experience of the professor's personality. So I'm, I'm thinking this person's question is more so about how individual professors are going to be conducting their classes, Dr. Hooker. Right, and that's, that, that, that's a tough question because um, faculty across um, the various disciplines, disciplines are going to uh, facilitate this experience probably a little different, um, but there are some expectations. If, if faculty, is teaching in the online world, then there's an expectation that PowerPoint and all of those things are readily available for students. Um, there's an expectation that there's opportunities to have um, uh, online discussions with faculty, um, whether that's blogging, um, there are opportunities to make sure um, that you meet with the faculty in their virtual office hours. Um, so um, it's, it's hard to answer that question because it, it varies from one um, faculty member to the next, um, but there are some expectations as to what all online courses should consist of. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question, uh, a question about uh, will everything be on pause again? P-A-W-S, not. Will everything um, the, I can read the entire question. It says, how will classes run fall semester this year? Will everything be on pause again? Pa pause is our learning management system, which right. complements again the classroom. So some of our classes which are fully online will definitely be facilitated in pause. Even those that are hybrid, there will uh, be some uh, integration with pause and, and Dr. Hooker can certainly elaborate on that further. Um, and I think if I'm going to link this question with what I 
think I heard in the last question is that will everything in terms of the online format be um, just preloaded information or will you have an opportunity to interact with your faculty member? And there is a combination of both. Some of our online courses will have um, online content and Dr. Hooker, I'm going to again toss it to you, but then there are also those opportunities when we talk about hybrid where you will actually be able to participate and experience your faculty member as you're experiencing us real time. And so if you can elaborate on that, Dr. Hooker, just a bit, I think I'm linking these questions just a bit and, and interpreting what my students might be asking. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing a very good job, so thank, so thank you for that. So when it comes to the online world, you're going to have um, um, synchronous learning versus um, asynchronous learning. And synchronous learning students will be the type of interaction that is occurring real time. So you're in the online environment, you're having interactions and real time discussions with faculty and students. If it is asynchronous, then this allows many of you to sort of do the work um, at your convenience, so it's not real time per se, though you still have the opportunity to um, chat with, with the instructor, though the response may be delayed. So that's the difference between those two. Now, if you move into the, the hybrid world, the hybrid world offers two components. It could offer um, the online component, com component um, in most instances is asynchronous. So it's not real time. There's some work that you need to do online. You can have you know, discussions with the instructor that he or she may respond to at that time if it's during their virtual office hours or maybe at a later time. But then the other component is the face-to-face -face interaction or the Microsoft Teams interaction in which there is some real-time discussions because you are face-to-face -face or virtually face-to-face. -face. So I hope that that answers the question that you may have. Okay. Great. We, our next two questions are similar and, and different at the same time. Our first student says, I want to take a drawing 101 course. It's being offered online. It's hard to imagine a drawing class being held online. How would that work? I've asked an advisor and they were unsure. Dr. Hooker. All right, so if it is online, so let me let me tell you, so the and I love saying the beauty of something because I'm always looking for ways to be innovative and ways to do things differently than we've done it in the past. So if I was that instructor and by no means do not assume that I can draw at all. So I would have to sort of go to the drawing board in terms of figuring this out. Um, but we, let's say that we were offering the class in this particular modality that we're in right now because students, we're actually in Microsoft Teams right now. So right now we have the Q&A um, session, but if we were to remove that and, and, and um, operate in the typical Microsoft Teams um, format, then you and I will be able to have conversations with one another. So I would actually be able to show my screen and perhaps show you how I'm making this particular drawing or something like that. I'm a science guy, so if this was an anatomy and physiology class, I could actually take the cell and kind of go through all of the different components of a cell. I can take the carpal bones, the bones in your wrist, and actually identify all of those bones, and you will be able to see it. You and I will be able to interact with one another. I will be able to turn the bones so you can see the anatomical features of that bone. So I'm assuming that your drawing instructor is going to do something very similar to that. Great. Thank you. The next question is, will the summer semester labs meet at the Macon campus? I'm a biology major, Dr. Hooker. Student after your own heart right there and right. trying to determine when we will meet on campus and when online. OK, so very, again, very good question. So um, it is safe to say that all natural science courses, so whether that's biology, anatomy and physiology, chemistry, micro, all of those courses will be online. So you will have virtual labs and things of that nature. So there will be no campus access for those particular courses. Now, if you're in um, EMS or if you're in nursing or if you're in rad tech or PTA, physical therapy assistant, there will be some access to campus. Uh, but other than that, and then maybe a few courses in business, all of the other courses will be 100% uh, online. All right, thank you. Uh, a similar question, are all fall classes online for new students? And 
Well, it's hard to answer that question because I would have to have an idea of what the, your schedule is going to look like. Um, but for many of the lecture courses, for example, many of the courses in our human humanities, like English and things like that, yes, absolutely, they will certainly be online. And if you are a freshman, then the likelihood of your classes being totally online is pretty high. Yes. Because you have not gotten into the meat of your um, of your curriculum yet at that point. And, and some of our limited uh, CTE courses, our career and technical programs actually integrate uh, some of the content early on in, in, in the first semester. So certainly look at your schedule. Again, if you have questions, contact your advisor that will specifically tell you whether or not all of your classes are online or not. Great. Um, and this student is wondering if they have to still have to fill out a health form for fall semester. Absolutely, that is still a part of our admissions requirement. And um, I, I talked about earlier that we have um, moved things to an operational place. Um, and now we are allowing all of those forms to be uploaded through the portal. So if you have completed it, if it's not done through um, um, a, a DocuSign or um, electronic document, you can actually upload your completed copy, snap a, a picture of it. We're very flexible with how we receive it. Uh, we know that not everyone, I, I read an email or a, a meme very recently that said, stop asking our Gen Zers and our millennials to scan things because we don't have a scanner. And we understand that. We are fine with you not having a scanner. So please snap a picture and upload us a JPEG of your document and we can certainly, again, help ensure that they meet the requirements of, of um, your admissions. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, Dr. Hooker, this is another question about on campus. In the fall, will CIT courses have an on-campus component at the Macon campus? At this time, I, I don't know because we're in the process of, of putting all of this together. So we're in, we're in heavy discussions as we speak. Um, um, to make sure that um, one, we, we identify those courses that will have uh, campus access and that we're able to clearly communicate this to you. So in the coming weeks, very, very soon, we should be able to share more information with you. Great, thank you. Um, and I believe uh, VP Faulkner, this is probably yours. Well, I get help with choosing my classes and filling out my schedule. Absolutely. I uh, anticipate that this is one of my new or prospective students. Uh, so welcome, New Saluki. Um, and the answer to that question is yes, we are a mandatory advising institution, which means that in order for you to be cleared for registration, you have to meet in some form via telephone, Skype, um, or Zoom or Teams with an advisor in order to get your classes scheduled. If you are a new student who has completed all of your requirements, then you should have been invited to do an online or sign up for a virtual new student orientation. If you are attending one of those new student orientations, you will actually have a chance at that particular event to meet with an advisor, complete your registration on site meaning on-site virtually, okay? They are all facilitated facilitated through Microsoft Teams this summer. So uh, yes, you will uh, be able to work with an advisor to get your schedule and uh, talk through um, all of the nuances and requirements. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hooker, the next uh, question is from a student who I think had some struggles in the spring based on their comments. Uh, they're saying, uh, uh, Based on VP Hooker's response, why could this have not been done during the spring semester and why were students issued an F, F grade considering the direct disruption of classes and locations? Um, I'm not sure exactly what all the question entails is that's all they've said, but my understanding of this would be that the student received an F and perhaps thought they should have received an I. What should they do? Well, and I'm sorry, student, that you, you had to encounter that. Um, and, and it's really difficult to, to address the question, considering that I don't know all the specifics associated with the course. Um, but if there were issues with the course as it pertains to um, being able to receive tech, if there were technological issues um, on both ends, your, from your end as well as the faculty members end, 
then perhaps that was something that should have been considered. Um, hopefully you've been in contact with that instructor. If not, I would ask that you do so and have a conversation um, with the instructor. Um, there's also opportunities to, um, um, if, if you have true concerns, you could uh, file a complaint and then there's an opportunity to do the grade appeal as well. Um, you can find information about both online and you can just follow those steps and then um, your, your concerns will certainly be considered. Thank you. And here's another one for you, Dr. Hooker. And again, it's about classes being canceled. Um, can we prevent a class from being canceled despite having low registrants? Uh, I have I have had classes canceled due to only three or four students being enrolled, and this has impacted my path to graduation. Very similar to the previous person that asked, asked this question, but in case in case uh, this person didn't hear the answer, Dr. Hooker, could you help them? Right, and, and again, I asked that person to reach out to me personally, but there, there's also, um, um, you may be able to work with your advisor because the course that you want may not be available, but there may be other courses that you can take. Mm -hmm. um, and even if that course is filled, if this is impacting your graduation, we could look at ways for waiving that and to allow you to get in that class. So um, even if, if, because we certainly do not want um, to impact your graduation as a result, a result of a class being canceled, VP Faulkner would not allow me to do that. Absolutely so, not. <laughs> so uh, please contact your advisor and then we can figure to determine if we can get you into another class. Absolutely. There, there are course substitutions. There are um, the ability to work directly with our faculty partners to look at alternate courses that might be available that can meet that same specific needs. Absolutely. Um, I often say, and, VP, and Dr. Hooker's exactly correct in saying it's not helpful to you as a student or us as an institution to get you to third base and not help you get home Absolutely. and to help you graduate. So we are uh, committed to helping you uh, complete your course. Great. Thank you. Uh, 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 VP, VP Graham, can I jump in one other thing? Sure. And I also sure. want to, at this point, just introduce a new work that we're doing at Southway, Southwest. Many of you have seen, who've been with us for a couple of years, um, some of the intentional redesign work that has happened across the college to ensure that your process, your matriculation, and um, just your interaction in your student experience is more seamless. We have been dedicated to making sure that you are able to navigate seamlessly throughout your um, path and your tenure here at Southwest. Well, now we're engaged in a work that's called reimagining Southwest. And that reimagining Southwest works means that we're going to do what we've done over the past four years, but take it to a new level. And many of you have alluded to some concerns surrounding scheduling. Uh, Dr. Hooker will be working again collaboratively with uh, individuals in my team to ensure that we are scheduling with the student in mind. That to ensure that if you are a student who starts as, an, as a night student and wants to complete your path as a night student, that there's a pathway that allows you to do so. If you are a student who starts online, that you don't get to your third semester and suddenly have to alter your work schedule to try to come to campus to complete a class because if you could be an, an, an on-campus student you probably would have been enrolling in that. So again we're going to be intentional with how we look at our schedule and how we look at the work that we do to ensure that we're not putting unintended barriers in your way as a student to completion. So um, just look forward to hearing more about how we will reimagine Southwest in the years to come and that includes looking intentionally at scheduling. Thank you, VP Faulkner. Um, our next question I believe is also yours. How can one get a current student ID and or proof of enrollment? Absolutely. So um, we are working right now in our uh, final stages of uh, a manner in which you can do online ID submission. So um, I, I've just read a proposal from our uh, Director of Student Development, uh, Director Phoenix Worthy, who's responsible for IDs. And uh, we're again in final stages of introducing to you a manner in which you can upload your pictures. We know that you don't like the picture that we take often anyway. You enjoy your selfie a little more and that's okay. 
<laughs> and so we are working on your ability to upload um, a, a quality picture that can be utilized for IDs. And we will again arrange with how you will be able to receive your ID. So look forward to that information. Um, again, as we are looking to reimagine Southwest, we know that many of our students will be fully online. We need to figure out ways in which you can complete your education without having to physically come to our campus. And this is a part of that work. Thank you, BP Faulkner. Um, I believe this question is probably for Dr. Hooker. I have already registered for my fall semester classes and was allowed to choose Maxine Smith. Does, th does that mean I'm taking the classes at Maxine Smith or will they be adjusted to being online? Very good question. And again, we're still working out the details uh, regarding especially campuses other than Macon and Union. We're still working out those details. Um, if it is a, a course, again, if it's an English, if it's one of your humanities, then in all likelihood it is going to be online. Um, at Maxine Smith, there's a great chance that that course is going to be online, but give us, give us a week or two and then we'll have a schedule that we can share that, that provides more clarity. Great, thank you. Uh, VP Faulkner, this one is for you. I believe uh, it's from Justin. Justin asked, when, when will the $500 book award be sent out? Okay, um, we, will, we will give confirmed information um, again in coming weeks. Historically, that uh, book award has been available to students at least one to two weeks prior to the start of the semester. I will work with our cashier's office to ensure a communique goes forward. Um, what I will encourage students to do, because that book award, if I'm assuming correctly, it's the one based upon financial aid. That book award is based upon you having um, over award in your financial aid. So it's important that you've completed all of your financial aid requirements. The earlier you complete your financial aid requirements, you will actually see your financial aid award show up, your Pell Grant, SEOG, or any other state or awards that have been granted will show up on your uh, detailed um, 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 itemized bill for the campus. It will also show your charges for your for your classes. So if you're in 12 hours, 15 hours, and you, you notice how I'm encouraging you full time, 12 hours, 15 hours. If you're in those number of, of hours, you it will show you how much of your tuition and fees has been assessed. If there is an amount that's left over, that's where the book award comes in. So I said all of that to say, please respond to your financial aid requirements. If you receive anything in your dashboard that says you've been chosen for verification, you need to present information about selected services, anything that shows up in your dashboard that says you have an outstanding requirement for admissions or financial aid can delay your financial aid if you do not fulfill that. Great. Um, and VP Faulkner, I would like to take the opportunity to, to just put in a word for the tag three, get one free. If you are a full pay student, a full yeah. pay, you're not receiving any scholarship, any financial aid, we have a limited number uh, of opportunities for people to pay for three classes and get one free. If you're interested in that, reach out to uh, Sandra Wallace in our financial aid office. I'm sorry, cashier's this office. This is in finance. I knew as soon as I said it, it was the wrong place. <laughs> but it's Sandra Wallace, and she can give you more details. But again, that is for people who are full pay, not receiving financial aid or scholarships. Um, our next question is about internships. Um, so I'm going to leave that open uh, to both the VPs. How are you guys going about internships? That is all I need to graduate. And that's from N. Butler. OK, and when I hear that is all I need to graduate, I think it's not necessarily the paid internships that's through my program, but there are some experiential learning requirements in some of our majors that um, uh, where students actually actually have to sign up for courses to complete um, hands on experience. So I'm going to defer to Dr. Hooker about that. Thank you. And, and what's happening now, many of those externships uh, internships, I'm sorry that that um, students have. We have to work with those partners, um, those industry individuals to make sure that 
um, we're following their guidelines and we have access to their campus. For example, uh, many of our health program who have clinical opportunities, many of those have been canceled because of what is taking place at those facilities. Mm -hmm. So our chairs and deans are working with those respective entities and we will hopefully have something sorted out soon and more communications uh, will occur and, and, and you will be well informed. Thank you. We have another question from Elaine Swain. I finished my degree fall of 2020. I want to take additional courses. Are they flex hybrid information? Is I guess is there flex or hybrid information available now? If so, can I complete another degree before graduation 2021? I only need nine. I, I'm assuming that's nine hours. Um, Dr. Hooker, uh, can you answer that or does she need to reach out? Well, or maybe that's, that's probably a dual question for both of us and I will um, uh, jump in immediately because I, I think there might be some other implications that I want to make sure that I uh, prescribe before Dr. Hooker talks about the academic component to this. Um, we have implemented a program that's required by the Department of Education called Course Program of Studies and we uh, affectionately call it CPOS. But CPOS requires that students are enrolled in courses that lead to their completion of their degree program. Once they have completed that degree, um, they are no longer eligible for aid to take just additional courses. And so I wanted to ensure that if this was a question regarding financial aid um, that we clarified, so in order to be able to do a dual degree or an additional degree or even stackable credentials is a specific uh, appeal upon completion to the financial aid department that will be looked at on an individualized basis. Um, because as an associate's grant and institution, um, your financial aid is a lifetime history. So it connects not only at Southwest, but if you later decide that you want to complete a baccalaureate degree, it then connects to you at your baccalaureate grant and institution. What we attempt to do is ensure that we minimize excess hours that students take at Southwest that leaves them eligibility upon transfer if they ever decide to do so. So we consider what we call time and a half. Um, so it takes 60 hours for um, the vast majority of our associate degree programs and the De Department of Education allows students 90 hours. That's time and a half in order to complete a degree and at that point their eligibility for aid ends. So I wanted to answer that from a financial aid aspect, but then Dr. Hooker can talk about um, the double major portion and completion of the additional courses. Right, and I and, and actually, VP Faulkner, I was going to delve into your area because I, I think that question was, I think that that question really, um, you've addressed that question um, mm -hmm. because in order for me to um, determine whether or not there's another a degree that um, this student can attain, we will have to go through advising, look at, um, what prereqs and all of those things. So um, mm -hmm. that why don't why don't you meet with your advisor, um, consider yes. the information that was shared by VP Faulkner, um, yes. and if and if you still have questions, don't hesitate. Just reach out to me. Either of us, absolutely. Right. Um, our next question. I'm taking art and early history for the summer, Dr. Hooker. This sounds like it's going to be yours, <laughs> uh, although it may not be. Where do I buy my books for this? or will the instructor provide the books or will the books be online? So. And I think it's just depends. Well, I will jump in um, in in deference to my colleague being a recent addition to our team. Uh, so it, it it certainly will depend upon the course. Some of our courses, as I stated earlier, um, will have an ebook already assigned, and you will actually see that on your itemized bill um, uh, on on the portal. Uh, on you know, go into your uh, e portal, um, your Southwest, my Southwest portal. Um, and you can actually see your tuition and fees. And in some of the courses will actually have an electronic book already assessed. And so in that instance, there will not be a need to purchase a separate book unless you opt out of that book. Um, now for those other courses, that's where you can actually go to the virtual bookstore and um, Follett Bookstore, who is our, our vendor, works closely with our faculty members in order to identify and meet the needs of, of each uh, respective class 
And so you can actually go and put in your schedule, put in the course, and it will tell you what is the book and how to uh, retrieve it. So certainly it will be a combination of both. Either you can buy it through the virtual bookstore and it might actually be integrated into um, your course uh, and, and into your course fee structure. I doubt very seriously faculty will be able to give you individual books. So I will answer that one, but um, the other two options probably exist. Great, thank you. Um, our next our next student uh, posted that they struggled. Uh, I'm presuming this is spring semester and because of some technical issues received lower grades than they had hoped. Um, what should they do at this point? I think Dr. Hooker, you addressed that um, with the person who talked about getting an F. They should reach out to their professor first. Is that correct? Right, so you have a couple of options. Obviously, it's always best to go to the instructor, right? So have that conversation with your instructor. Um, in the event that it's not resolved there, then you do have the options of complaints and grade appeals. Great. Great. So our next student is concerned that they appreciate that both of you are uh, being very fair and interested in the students uh, graduating and taking the classes they need. They're concerned that perhaps some of our instructors do not have the same vision. Um, and and Dr. Hooker, could you speak to what this, the instructors have done, the professors have done this to get ready uh, for teaching online going forward? Right. Uh, well, well, first, I, I know, again, in March, we had to quickly shift to an online environment, and I know there were a lot of um, obstacles that we had to um, deal with, I mean, from, from both ends, from the student's perspective, from the faculty's perspective, even from staff perspective, even from VP Faulkner's and VP Graham's area. So it was a learning curve for all of us because though this is something that we're excited to be doing now, and it's probably something that we should have been doing, we were not doing it. Um, so this crisis has allowed, has put us in a place of, uh, of trying to improve to make sure that we're able to meet your needs. Um, I would like to think that um, our team is going to be an extension of the leadership. So VP Faulkner and all of us um, truly um, want to put you in the best position to be successful. Um, so we're hoping that everything that we're saying is trickling down all the way from um, to the divisions, to the programs, and into the courses. So we're hopeful that the faculty will take on the, the same sentiments that we have and ensuring your success, being empathetic. Um, you know, one of the things that we don't want faculty to do, we don't want them to minimize or reduce the rigor, but we certainly want to make sure that they provide you with what you need to be successful. Um, I, I do believe your experience is going to be is going to be much different than what it was um, in, in March, because again, we were all quickly trying to move to a new new world, a new environment. Um, now with faculty um, having time to build their courses um, with the mandate of all faculty completing the online training certification, I feel pretty confident that your experience is going to be different. Um, so um, give us a chance. Thank you for trusting us again. And we, we will certainly um, um, fulfill your needs. Thank you, Dr. Hooker. Uh, VP Faulkner, I believe this one is yours. Sure. How will students with accommodations receive their services in an online learning environment? Absolutely. Um, we have a very strong um, student advocate in our new center, center for Access. So for um, those students who might have previously been registered with um, what was previously known as our Students with Disability Services Office is now known as the Center for Access. Um, our director, Ms. Courtney Gibson, is excellent and she has um, sought resources and the support services needed to ensure that your accommodations translate to an online environment. She's just recently facilitated two sessions with our faculty um, last week, as recent as last week, about how to support students in this new online world um, who might come to us with um, disabilities, with learning or physical disabilities. So again, all of our decisions have been made with you at the center and at the core. So note that there will not be um, any decline um, or lessening of your support that's needed even in this online environment. So for students who are returning and have previously um, worked with our Center for Access or our new students or uh, prospective students who might have had an IEP uh, in their respective high schools, 
please connect as soon as possible with our Center for Access, Ms. Courtney Gibson, to ensure that you are able to fill out all the requisite uh, documentation and um, receive your letter of accommodation that will then be shared with you and your faculty member for the fall. Great, thank you. Uh, we, our next question is about Pell Grants. Uh, right. Does the Pell Grant cover summer session two? And when will we know if we are awarded? In addition, is there a book allowance? It all depends on availability of your aid. So um, there is a maximum amount for the entire academic year. And so yes, whereas we have summer Pell Grant, summer Pell only applies to a student who had leftover Pell from the fall and spring. So if you did have leftover Pell from fall and spring, then you should be awarded if you have no outstanding documents. If you've not received anything in your dashboard that says you have outstanding documents, um, yet you've not seen an award, I encourage you to again meet with our financial aid team through their office hours or work directly with your financial aid specialist to ask if there's any available funding for the poll. But we have Pell Grant, we have SEOG, we have uh, pockets of money where we are trying to assist as many students as possible to uh, meet that financial need for the summer. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hooker, here's another one of your uh, science friends. It, Mr. Searcy said, I am sure, I'm sure you have answered this already, but how will they be handling science lecture courses and labs in the fall? Thank you for that question. And, and um, so the lecture, the lecture component of that course um, can easily be taught online. Um, I would imagine that um, the lab component of your course will be taught in a modality such as this, Microsoft Teams, in which your instructor will be able to show his or her screen. And then there will be interactions between, um, between the two of you and the entire class. Um, so I, I think it's a it's a really, really good way um, to do this without you having to try to access a class and deal with the weather and all of those things. So I guess I'm, I'm looking at the brighter side of this new experience for us, um, but you, with Microsoft Teams and some of the new technology that we have, it's going to allow you to have, still have the, the virtual face-to-face -face interactions where you can really be engaged and you can ask questions and you can see. Um, so I, I think we're still going to be able to meet your needs in the, even though we may not have the face-to-face -face interaction that, that most of us um, 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 truly um, aspire to have. Thank you, Dr. Hooker. We're going to take this time. Um, we've got about four minutes left uh, in this forum, but we want to do a brief walkthrough of the Back to Campus website. So Daphne, if you could pull that up and walk us through it. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Daphne Thomas. I'm over the communications and marketing function here at the college. I'm going to start with our home page and then I'm going to take you to our back to campus so to show you how to get to it. OK, so let me share my screen. OK, now this is the Southwest uh, home page and what you see uh, is this bar here that says the COVID a news and resources that takes you to our COVID site. And when you first come to the page, you will see this slider. And if you don't see this slider right here, just click this yellow bar and it will take you to the back to campus plan site. Now this site is a fully HTML site, so it addresses all accessibility uh, issues. It's designed to walk you through uh, the plan and so beginning tomorrow, we will be in phase one. So if you want to know what phase one looks like, you can simply go to the drop down menu. And here is a description of phase one. It shows you the locations impacted, the objectives, and the basic guidelines for safety and so forth, okay? In addition, we have areas of you want to really delve deep, more deeply into uh, safety, you can go to campus access and it has uh, all of the uh, descriptions and protocols for access for employees and students. OK, and for students in particular, uh, we have a drop down menu where you can see the new academic calendar, information about course delivery and also FAQs. OK, 
Now I'm going to go back to the home page of this site, the back to campus plan, and over here to the right, uh, know before you go, this is where you see this red button. This is where you take your campus assessment every day before you arrive to campus. So when you click that, this is the uh, health declaration or assessment we talked about earlier. It takes about two minutes to fill this out. Once you push submit, you will receive an email or text. You have the options here that will tell you whether you passed or not. OK, now, now and that's what you show to security when you arrive to campus. Also on the home page of the back to campus plan, there's a news and updates area. I uh, encourage you to check this every day. OK, if there's any new or emerging information or changes to our protocols, we will put those announcements right here. What you see here now is the last back to campus town hall and that uh, will take you to the Q&A and we've uploaded all of the questions and answers to the last Q&A to the last town hall that was on June 15th. OK, um, if you want to rewatch this um, uh, broadcast, once it becomes available, we will upload it here and you can watch it on demand. So this is a very, very important section to look at news and updates. If you want to see what's coming in the fall, you can go. That's phase two. It says fall 2020. Here you will see the locations that will be open. And you will also see an overview of the guidelines. Again, the same safety protocols will be in effect unless we have to change due to pandemic conditions. And if we have a change of any kind, the phase two page here will be updated and we will place um, notifications right here in the news and updates section. So again, I'm going to go back to our home page. This should it didn't take me back to the home page. Hold on. Let's go back to the Southwest home page so I can show you one more time. So to get to the back to campus plan page, you can click this graphic. If you do not see this graphic, this is yellow section here it says visit the back to campus plan site and you can also get to the health assessment from here as well on the Southwest home page. I hope this information is helpful. Thank you, Daphne. I think that was very helpful. Um, we have run out of time, friends. There are a couple of questions I think we didn't address. We will answer those and they'll be on that site exactly where Daphne said. We appreciate you uh, tuning in with us today and asking your questions. Please know if you think of something later that you wish you should have answered, asked rather, you can reach out to uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hooker if it's an academic question. Um, if it's something regarding student services, please reach out to VP Faulkner. If you're not sure, send it to me and I will then send it on. We appreciate y'all and we are so excited to have Salukis back on campus tomorrow. We look forward to seeing you all. Uh, VP Faulkner, VP Hooker, do y'all have any last words? Just we hope that you have found this session to be helpful. We've tried to be as open and transparent about all of our thoughts and our planning, um, very thoughtful planning that has gone into preparing for tomorrow and the fall. Um, if there are any lingering questions, I echo VP Graham's sentiments. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Engage with your advisors. Engage with your enrollment specialists. Engage in our, some of our interactive sessions that happen every Friday through our recruitment office that will actually give additional and supplemental information to what you've learned today. There are a number of ways in which we're getting information into your hands. We don't want you to have anxiety and concerns as we prepare um, for the fall and prepare to reopen. We have been working diligently and thoughtfully to ensure that we are keeping our students and our campus safety at the core of the decision making and we will continue to do that. So feel free to reach out to us again if you have any questions and again thank you for being on this session and students i'll be brief i know you're ready to uh you've been with us an hour and a half and you're probably ready <laughs> to get to the next phase of your day uh, but i would echo what vp faulkner has has noted uh, but i would also say uh, be vocal 
be very vocal about the experience that you're about to encounter, especially uh, to the students that are going to access campus. Um, we want to learn more about your experience so to make sure that the protocols that we've put in place work and if we need to make some modification to those. So be very vocal. I mean, I'm sorry, be very vocal. And um, we look forward to uh, having you back on campus and learning more about your experience. So thank you so very much for taking this time to meet with us. Thank you. Goodbye. Right. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.